All right, grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles. We're going to dive in right away. Grab your Bibles. If you don't have them, pull up your cell phone because it works too. Very thankful for all of you. Very much I have been looking forward to this night for a very long time. We ta I've talked about it in with the elders back since last year and um, have thought about it for a number of years, wanting to spend some time just talking with you and encouraging you. Um, I did a, an evaluation of our, our membership list and realized that there was a large portion of our congregation that was single. And it ranges in generations. We have a lot of high schoolers, too, that aren't here. We wanted it just above high school and all the way up. And not all of our older singles came, but I was. Uh, we have a few in the room, and I won't point you out, but I'm thankful that you're here. Very grateful for your presence in our life. Uh, a matter of fact, uh, one of them is speaking. Uh, she would hate that I called her a little bit older, but she's going to give her testimony tonight, and um, just very, very thankful uh, for all of you. Um, so let's dive in. I have a question for you. Where does the Bible talk about singleness? Where does the Bible talk about singleness? Yes, sir, Daniel. 1 yes, 1 Corinthians 7. That's the, he stole the easy one, right? 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, is there any others, any other places in the Bible where the Bible talks about singleness? Matthew 19. Yeah, marriage and divorce and a little bit there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Matthew 19. Any others? Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Yes. It was kind of short-lived, wasn't it? Uh, we don't know how long it was that he was single, but he was single for, Adam was single for a little bit at least, right? He was single for a little bit. Any, any others that you can think of? Yes, there, that was the, the process of trying to get him married off was to go and find a spouse for Isaac, right? Uh, don't you wish it was that easy, right? Just the one, the camel, drinks the, the, the person that I go see if they will feed my camels, and that's the woman, right? And it, somebody else, too, right? They get the process of getting the spouse for Isaac. Isaac doesn't do it. Somebody else does it. Um, some of you might say, I don't want that process, right? Uh, you want somebody else to pick your spouse for you? But even that passage is ultimately talking about eventually getting married, right? And Genesis 2, short. Really, the only one I could come up with directly was 1 Corinthians 7. Directly? Ouch. Does that mean that God doesn't care about you? No, it could not be further from the truth. Could not be further from the truth. How about this one? If you want a single person in action, did you know that the Apostle Paul was single? So his whole life, to a degree, at least what we have recorded of him, you have a single person. You can watch him all the way through the book of Acts. That's starting in chapter 9, right? Single man. We're not 100% sure whether he was married for and his wife had died or because some say that Pharisees had to be married but uh, we know for a fact by 1 Corinthians 7 that he was single okay how about this one the most amazing person in the entire Bible by far was single who was that absolutely Jesus was Contrary to the Da Vinci Codes, Jesus did not marry. He was single. He stayed single his whole entire life and died on a cross. Single. He died single. And he's the hero of everything, isn't he? One worthy of all of our honor 
and glory. The two most significant people in the Bible were single. Paul, that's arguably at least, Paul and Jesus. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says this. He says, where's my remote? There it is. Paul says, look at 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Paul says, he says, yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. So Paul says, I wish, I desire that all men were even as my, I myself am. And he's talking about his what here? His singleness. So Paul's desire is, is that everybody would be single. Wow, that's a profound thought, isn't it? And yet, Pastor Mike has a confession here that for many of my years of ministry, I've been blowing it on the singles issue. I'm going to lay it out there to you. I've actually been thinking, who can I match you up with? And I have a confession for you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Because I was stealing the gift of God that you are. Please forgive me. We start with the forgiveness. Okay? If the Apostle Paul desired for every man to be single, then there must be some kind of value in being single. What do you think? There's great value in it. And I'm more and more convinced of it the longer I read the scriptures. Praise God. Y'all are single. Way to go, God. You'll see as we go along. We have said this many times, but it bears repeating. We must not let our feelings or our culture, the world, tell us that our status is defined by whether we're married or not, whether we're good or not. Do you understand that, do you understand that one of the reasons why in the homosexual agenda that the man and the man wanted to marry and the woman and one, woman wanted to marry, were, it's ultimately this idea of being approved by the culture and the society, that marriage is your approval stamp. The culture has been lying to you. Your pastor, to a degree, has been lying to you on this issue. I know. You're like, man, this is harsh. You're really going after yourself. Yes, I am. And by the grace of God, this will never happen again. I'm thankful that you're single. God made you single right now. And I praise God for that truth. And you have to get to the place where you're thankful for it too. You need that. So it's important to know. It appears that as ages go along in the Bible, just looking at the Bible, did you know at first it appears that marriage is very, very important. Very important. In Genesis 2, we see almost immediately he marries, right? He gives Eve. It appears that as you go along in Scripture, that marriage becomes less and less important. And as you go along in ages in the Bible, it becomes less and less important. What do you mean? Well, when, when Jesus shows up and when Paul shows up, it appears that the attention gets shifted away from marriage as much because the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm single and I wish all could be single. It's very interesting. It's very interesting that he implies that it's a good thing to be single. <laughs> Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't sing, uh, get married. I'm not saying don't ever get married. That's not what the passage is saying and not what the Bible is saying either. But what does Jesus say about marriage in heaven? What's he say about marriage in heaven? There isn't any. 
There isn't any. Hmm. If marriage is what satisfies us, and marriage is so great, then why isn't it in heaven? Why isn't it appear, it appears that it's not in the new heavens and the new earth either? When everybody's glorified, no more marriage. What's going on? Maybe it's our society has got it completely backwards. Maybe we're missing something. You're like, Pastor Mike, I didn't think this was going to work. I didn't know you were going here. This doesn't make any sense. I thought this was a matchmaking service that you were coming to today. Meet all the single per people in here so you can have great fellowship and therefore you can get married. No, that's not a good singles conference. It's not what it is. So tonight I want to encourage you. My desire is to encourage you to embrace the gift that you are and the gifts that you have. My prayer is that I will help you to realign your perspective on singleness. I know you'll be tempted to think, well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Mike. You have a wife of 25 years and five kids. Real easy for you to say that. I mean, you're always bragging on your wife. You're always talking about how amazing she is. But friends, I want you to understand something. My first love is not Brenda. I'm not promised another day with Brenda. And I will not be married to Brenda forever. And I'm okay with that. No, it is not because I don't love Brenda. <laughs> you know, I love her. It's because what God wants for me is more than a marriage relationship with a woman. He wants something more for me than marriage to Brenda. God wants me to know and enjoy him exclusively in the future. And I'm okay with that. And a matter of fact, I would wish it to happen right now. I'm ready for the rapture. Now, right this second. How about y'all? So tonight as, I, as we start, I want to look at a passage that's revolutionized my thinking on singleness. There is an amazing passage in the Bible that describes singleness amazingly. It's beautiful. It has transformed the way I think. It's why I'm talking to you totally different than I've probably ever talked to you before. It's this passage. You ready? Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. When you get there, don't laugh out loud. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. I'll read it for us. <laughs> are you getting it yet? You're like, what in the world are you talking about, Pastor Mike? Why are you reading the marriage chapter in Ephesians? Why? Makes no sense. It's like preaching divorce about talking about divorce at a at a wedding right or talking about the prodigal son at a baby dedication right what in the world do you talk about ephesians 5 22 at a singles conference have you lost your ever living mind let's look and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. 
Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husband, husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all his glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He, he who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. How many of you have read that passage a couple thousand times? Heard it read? And probably groaned when you heard it a couple times. Any of you groaned? Any of you thought it and said, man, I wish I didn't have to hear this passage again. Right? Again, question. Who's writing the passage? Simple question. Who's writing it? God. I, I had Paul and God, and that's the answer. Yes. Paul and God. Good job. You nailed it. Paul. Paul. A single man. A single man is writing a passage on marriage. Insane. In our society, he would be considered a fool. Because why? You don't understand. You're single. But Paul is writing it under the divine inspiration of God, directed by Jesus Christ himself, a single man. Filled with Christ. Christ. Writing through Paul on marriage. What? And Paul here, notice that there's a metaphor. It implies importance of marriage. But an important marriage is in view. And Paul was, in fact, now I'm going to throw a shift here, not single. He wasn't single. Did you know that Paul wasn't single? He was not single. I thought you said he was single. He's not single. He was married. Really? Who's he married to? To Jesus. Oh, no. You're blowing it all up. It's the same problem again that our society defines marriage. It's going to destroy. You know, I got angry at the devil today as I was writing this sermon. I got so intensely angry. I was in firehouse subs. I almost screamed at the top of my lungs. I was so mad at him. Two men getting married does what? Destroys what this really is talking about because you can't think of it the right way. The culture in the world is destroying what you think about marriage and about who God is and what he thinks of you. We must not let that happen. Paul, the single man, speaks to the church about marriage. But the primary marriage Paul has in mind, and by extension the spirit and the son has in mind, is not physical marriage. The primary relationship in this whole passage is the marriage between Christ and the church. That's the main point of the passage. 
The passage is ultimately revealing the believer's wise walk in Christ and how they should live filled by the Holy Spirit in 518. Okay? And what does it look like when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and God's control in your heart? You submit to one another. You submit to the roles that God has given you, divinely given you. So that's an expression of it in verse 21. But notice the backdrop. The main foundation is we submit to the Lord's ordained authorities in our life. Wives submit to their husbands. Children submit to their parents. Chapter 6. And slaves submit to their masters. Chapter 6, verse 5. But the most important point is the reflecting the bigger relationship. The bigger relationship through our relationship with others. The bigger relationship. What's the bigger relationship? Walking wise is, is living for Christ as a blood brought bride of Christ. You're already brides. You're already spouses. You're already in a perfect relationship. A perfect relationship. You need nothing else. You've got the best spouse in the world. I promise. Because it's Jesus. So physical marriage is just an outward expression of the greater reality. My relationship with Brenda is only a glimpse of a bigger relationship. And friends, hear me. The dominant relationship you are already in must make the fact that you are single grow less and less important. Hear me. The more you understand how great he is, your singleness becomes what? Less and less important. Because you're ultimately in relationship already. Look at the passage. Who and what is it all about? At first glance, we think it's about marriage. But a closer look shows us that the primary relationship as Paul is pointing to is the bride of Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. The passage says what? 532. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. What mystery is great? Okay, now I'm going to, I hope you're going to be shocked numerous times as we go through this. What is the mystery that's great? Well, it's pointing back to verse 31. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Okay, David. This is from what chapter? Genesis chapter 2. This is from that marriage chapter. Well, it was single for a little bit, but then God said this passage, didn't he? This is what God said. What is he talking about? What in the world would Paul be talking about here? For this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Isn't, isn't it all about marriage of a man and a woman? Isn't it the union of two making one flesh relationship? Isn't that what he's talking about? Well, yes. And... No. What? Paul is saying the marriage relationship between Christ and his church is the standard and primary relationship. It's what it's all about. It's really all about Christ's relationship with the church. And ultimately what's really wild is all relationships are supposed to point to that relationship. The father-son relationship, the master-slave relationship, all relationships are supposed to put to that point to that one main relationship. So guess what this means, beloved? You're already in the relationship. If you're a believer in Jesus and you've turned from your sins and trusted in him, you're already in a relationship. 
Stop looking for another one. <laughs> You've got a good one. Oh, well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Mike. You're not going through what I'm going through. You got a wife for 25 years and five kids. Who's speaking? The Apostle Paul. Who was controlling him? Jesus. Paul had a relationship at the forefront of his thinking. The forefront of his thinking as a single man was his relationship with Christ. So the natural question every married person living in the 21st century could say is this. You ready? Wait, Paul. <laughs> You're single. How can you speak to my life and my problems in my marriage. How can you tell me how to be married to my wife? You're single. <laughs> you see the irony here? How can Pastor Mike speak to you about singleness when he's married? The answer is the same. One relationship must dominate all of our thinking and living. The relationship with Christ is the only one that really, 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 really matters. The relationship we have with Christ. So let's look down through it real quick. Look at it. Look at verse 25. Oh, dear friends, this passage is for you. This is for you. This is God's great big hug of you, okay? You're going to get the big hug right now. Look at verse 25. Christ also loved and gave him up himself. Gave up himself. What? Okay, verse 25, husbands love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. What's the point? Well, the comparison is what? Christ's love for who? who? Who does he love? Who does he love? There you go. Thank you. Us. Who does he love? Are you sure? How do you know? How do you know he loves you, Wendell? Says it. He loves you? Are you single? Ah, this man be listening. This man be listening. He loves us. How do we know he loves us? Because he gave himself up for us. He gave himself up for us? What does that mean? Ladies, listen to me. You'll never find a man that gives himself up for you like Jesus does. I promise. Men, you will never find a spouse to love you like that. I promise you. Only Jesus died for you. That's love, beloved. That's love. Are single people not loved? No, single people are loved greatly. Mar people that are believers in Christ are loved greatly. You're loved. You need no more love from anybody else. You're completely loved. Nobody in this world is going to give you as much love as him. I promise. You're loved. So what was the purpose of his love? Look at the next verse. So that he might sanctify her. So is this positional sanctification or progressive sanctification? Is it so that we will be set apart? 
positionally or is that it, we would be set apart and he would work in us and make us look holy and, there, and therefore final sanctification, we'd be glorified. Which one is it? Yes. Yes, all of the above. Yes. Yeah. Why did he love us and give himself up for us? So that we would be sanctified, set apart. He set us apart. How many of you, how many of you, how many of you look forward to the day, that wedding day? I know. You're, you're, oh, why are you bringing this up? That wedding day when you're, your bride, you're the bride, you're standing up here and everybody's looking at you and going, wow, you are mine, the man says. You're mine. This is mine. I can remember it. Brenda walking down the aisle. That's mine. That's mine. Crying tears. It's mine. I always like to watch the groom. Love to watch the groom. That's how Christ views you. Now. You're his. He set you apart. You're his. You know one of the things that shocked me and made me so attracted to my wife? Y'all are going to think I'm nuts. She didn't need me. She didn't. Y'all have heard, some of you have heard the story. Went on our first date. It wasn't a date. It was one of those group things we all let awkwardness, right? Went on one of those and we're in, the van, we're in the car. We're getting in the car. And she said, where's Mitch? <laughs> Who's Mitch? <laughs> you know, the guy in our Sunday school class, Mitch. Well, why do you want to know? Was she interested in Mitch? Not at all. She didn't need me. She was completely satisfied with Jesus, and it was so attractive. You need to be there. He set you apart, and he's setting you apart. He cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. How many of you just want a, a spouse that will encourage you in the word? Just give me one that will encourage me in the word. Got it already. You already got it. He's doing a fantastic job. You know how I know? You're here. On a Friday night, listening to a crazy man that's married talk to you about singleness. Why? Because the word of God is good to you, isn't it? And the word of God is working in you, isn't it? And it's because of Christ Jesus. He's already working in you and he loves you and he set you apart and he's sanctifying you. And he's washing you. He started conversion with the word. And he's working on you into the word. And he's going to work with you till the end. I am confident of this very thing that you who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Because your spouse loves you. Why? That he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless before him ah, wow do you understand that this means he 
wants us to be holy and blameless before him. He accomplished it at the cross by dying. We're now right with him and we're going to be holy and blameless before him. And he's in the process in our bodies of making us more, look more and more and more like him. And he doesn't give up. He never divorces you. He will never say bye. He will never, you'll never have a bad breakup with Jesus. Never. Why? Because he's committed to you. That's good news. Y'all should be jumping by now. Every one of you in the room should be going, wow, I am thankful I came. You are loved, beloved. So what's the next display of God's great love in Christ towards us? Look at it, verse 28. Well, this ain't it. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. What? Okay. So that's it, right? Paul's done talking about how Christ loves you. He's done. Now let's get on to it. You need a man. The ladies are thinking. You need a man to what? Love you like his own body. To nourish and cherish you, right? That's what you need, don't you? You need that, right? Look at verse 29. But nurses and cherishes it. Just as Christ also does the church. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hold on. Hold on. Wait a second. Hold on. You don't need an earthly spouse to nourish and cherish you. You know why? It's already happening. what it says he's already taken care of you you know why because you're his body you're his body this is the profundity of this this is amazing this is mind numbing one flesh relationship what means me and Brenda are one flesh. That means one flesh. That means whatever I do for her, I'm doing for my own body, right? And a good husband will nourish and cherish his own body. He'll take care of it, right? But who are we? Where is a body? We're already fully taken care of. He's nourishing and cherishing you. Jesus loves his own body. He sees us as part of himself. He sees us as one with him. He doesn't hate any of us. But he nourishes and cherishes each one of us. That's so good, isn't it? Again, why does he do this? Because we're married to him. We're his bride. Again, I hate how the enemy steals this truth. The males in the room, they're probably sitting here, oh, yeah, but what? That, what? That's strange. What? You know why? You know why? Listen. Listen. It's because the world tells you it's about your physical needs. It tells you it's way too much about here and now. It tells you it's too much about this. But it's not. It's about our souls and the delight we have in Him. 
And he nourishes and cherishes our souls and helps us to know him. And he is enough. He's enough. And I know you're like, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Mike. You have a wife. But if God took my wife, God forbid he doesn't, but if he does, he will give me the grace to find the joy in him. And when he's not enough, I pray that I would fall down on my knees and cry out to him to show me his glory and remind me of how much he loves me. Jesus nourishes and cherishes us. Why, though? Because we're members of his own body. It's a single passage, isn't it? Do you see it? Do you see it yet? Next time you go to the wedding and they preach on this passage, I want you to think of yourself as the bride. <laughs> You're already there. You know, Paul didn't have a problem with this, using this kind of metaphor, did he? And he was a what? Man. Maybe the problem's in our thought process. We can't see it because we're so caught up with Eros love. Is it possible? <clears throat> the answer is profound. Look at it. It was mystery for thousands of years. Verse 31. Where is it? There it is. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Again, a quote from Genesis 2, 24, but the Paul is applying it to Jesus and his bride, the church. This is why Jesus came into the world, beloved. Do you understand this? Jesus came to love his bride and to be united to her. He came to make us his body. He came so that he would be head of the body. And we would be what? The body. He'd be the head, we'd be the body. And he could nourish and cherish us, right? And take care of us and love us. This is a profound mystery, isn't it? Made known. People didn't get this for years and years and years. Genesis 2.24, that's it. Genesis 2.24, that's it. Now hang in there. Some of y'all in the room are like, okay, I got it, I got it. Let's go on. Just one more thing, you got to see this, it's mind-blowing. It's good, just hang in there, don't give up. Oh, dear ones, none of us is ultimately, ultimately needs a spouse. Why? Because we already have one. And he loves us perfectly. And we have all we need in him. This is why the Apostle Paul states, I wish all of you were single like me. Why would he say something like that? Now, the obvious question arises. The question. Are you saying that singleness shouldn't hurt? Ooh, now we're really going to jump into the deep end. Are you saying I, should be, I, shouldn't want, I should want to be single the rest of my life with no pain in my heart? Should the single person want to be single? <laughs> That's a tricky question, isn't it? No, I'm not saying that. Being in this world, in these bodies, is not easy. It's not easy. Everybody, I get it. It hurts. I got it. I didn't marry till I was 26. And some of y'all that are older, you're saying, oh. Well, of course, you got married at 26, and I'm older. Paul was single. Jesus was single. It's ultimately the word of God. 
Being in this world and in these bodies is hard. But how are we supposed to respond when the grief and the perceived loneliness overwhelms us? That's the question. How do we do it when loneliness starts to take over in our heart? Does that happen? Let's be honest. It does, doesn't it? How do we respond? First, we must counsel our hearts to remember who? Jesus. Remember that he's, you're not alone. That he's there with you and he loves you and he cares for you. You must counsel your heart that way. And rehearse his great love over and over and over. Second, we must trust him. Now, what do you mean, Mike? Why trust him? Well, because who is the head? Who's the head? What does head mean? If he's the head, what's that mean? I'll give you a hint. This is Sunday sermon coming up. He's sovereign. He's sovereign over the body. That anything that the body does and anything that happens to the body is directly under his authority. Okay, now I'm going to blow your mind. God has ordained for every single one of you, Christ has ordained for every single one of you to be single here today. He did it. How do I know? Because you're single. He ordained this. He's the head. But, 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 Pastor Mike, it was because I didn't say that right word to that girl that was kind of looking at me that time. But, 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 Mr. Mike, wait a second. If that guy would just quit being a deadbeat, I'd be okay and I'd be married. But, 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 Mr. Mike, if somebody would just come up and talk to me, they'd see I'm a really kind person, and maybe, then maybe, they'll know that I'm worth getting married to. Do you understand what's happening when you start allowing those lies to come in your head? You're giving the devil a foothold. He has. Christ is Lord over your life. He's the head. You will get married when he decides you will get married. Not one second before. That sounds very fatalistic, Mike. Isn't there human responsibility, Mike? Yes, there is. Do you understand that the Spirit of God works in every single human being in this world and every single person that's under his leadership gets married to you exactly when they're supposed to? Contrary to Pastor Mike doing matchmaking, God's sovereign plan is perfect. <laughs> he never misses. He's got 100%. Every single person that he is sovereign over gets married the exact moment he has ordained them for them to get married. Really? What if I meet a, marry a deadbeat that doesn't love Jesus? He ordained it. What? I admit to you, in my life, not my marriage, praise God, I've had numerous times where God gave me what I desired when it wasn't what I needed. 
if you run ahead, beloved, and marry somebody that's not a believer and try to force this, you are basically saying, you're not head over me. You understand? He could still ordain for you to get married. <laughs> he could have still had that happen. And you could still get married. But take it from me. It could be really, really hard. And I promise you, if you're forcing it, you're probably, you're probably going to get discipline and effects of the discipline the rest of your life. These are important decisions to make. What do you think? But Just round one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get there in the Q&A. We'll get there. Write the question down. It's a good one. Think on it. So important. So important. Well, I'll get to it. I don't want to go too much longer. Y'all got it, though, right? Who's the head? Christ is. By the way, you men in the room that are saying, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up. Oh, I don't want to mess up. Just give you a heads up. You can't mess up God's will. Seek Christ. Seek Christ. And then step up. Just being honest. Just being honest. If you're following the word, you'll be okay. If you're praying, he nourishes and cherishes you. He's not going to throw you under the bus. By the way, men, if you go to that woman and she says, not interested, you say, whoo, let me get that, whoo, I'll get a little better. Why? Why are you going, woo, to me? She should ask that question back to you when you go, woo. She should be asking that question back to you. You should say, because you're not the one Jesus wanted me to marry. Because if Jesus wanted me to marry you, you would marry me. I love you, sister. See you later. Boy, that's profound, isn't it? Oh, beloved, it is the love of Christ that motivates us to trust him when we don't get it. By the way, this means no single person is free to do whatever, whatever they wish. We must learn submission when? Now. If you can't submit to Jesus, then obviously, ladies, you're not ready to be submitting to a guy that's going to be a deadbeat compared to Jesus. I promise. Because every single man in the world is a deadbeat compared to him. Jeff included and Omar included and Stephen included, right? And all their wives say, Amen. And at the same time, men, you can't expect a woman to submit to you if you can't even trust the head yourself. If he's not enough for you now, a woman's not going to be enough for you now. As a matter of fact, your life will be just a disaster worse. Profound, isn't it? What a passage. Everybody's going to read that different now, right? Praise God. God's word's good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for our time together. Lord, help us now. Keep growing. Keep, keep learning. Thank you that you love us <laughs> beyond our wildest dreams. Help us to be satisfied with you. 
In Christ's name, amen.